Hey nerds, I'm Chris, and I want to help you get beautiful recordings. So will a power conditioner help you get beautiful recordings? And the answer to that is maybe. We're going to investigate it further in this video. I've got some power conditioners on hand that I've tested, and I've also got a bunch of different gear that I tested with the various power conditioners, and we're going to take a look at whether or not it did make a difference, and if it did, how much of a difference did it make? See, power conditioners are a bit of a confusing topic, and rightfully so, because there's various functions that a power conditioner can do, and any device that does these functions can be referred to as a power conditioner. So, for instance, a power conditioner can, one, offer surge protection that's more reliable than a power bar. If you have a lot of expensive equipment in your studio, I think it would be wise to protect it from electrical spikes that can destroy the gear. These electrical spikes are rare, but they do happen, such as if a nearby power line is struck by lightning. Two, rejection of radio frequency interference. Any wire can act as a radio antenna and absorb radio frequencies, which can become audible in the signal path. I once literally picked up a radio station with my keyboard plugged into a speaker. Some power conditioners will have a circuit which reduces or eliminates radio frequencies from the audio path. 3. Isolation. Some power conditioners will isolate its output power from the received power, which can eliminate ground loops, radio frequencies being picked up by the ground wire, or noise caused by other components somewhere else in the electrical grid, such as light dimmers which are notorious for creating electrical noise. 4. Electrical noise suppression. Now, this is the key feature that I'm going to be focusing on in this video. Electricity coming from your wall outlet is supplied as an AC current, alternating between positive and negative 60 times per second. If you were to plot it on a graph, it would look like a sine wave. However, if you were to zoom into this sine wave, you would see it's not perfectly smooth. There's little spikes and ripples in it. These little spikes and ripples can sometimes make it through the filters in the audio equipment and become present in the audio signal, resulted in added noise. Usually you'll hear it as a high frequency white noise. This can make a small difference in the amount of white noise you hear in some pieces of gear. For instance, your studio monitors. You know when you turn them on, you can hear that little bit of a hiss? Well, with good power conditioning, you're going to have a little bit less of a hiss. Also with preamps where you plug your microphone into, every preamp has a bit of a noise floor and if you have good power conditioning, you might get a little bit lower of a noise floor. So you can turn the gain up a little bit more without the noise becoming apparent. But how much of a difference does it really make? And what is good power conditioning? I keep saying good power conditioning, but what does that mean? Well, I tested three different power conditioners and got very different results between them. I tested them by testing the noise floor on some preamps as well as the noise floor on some studio monitors. And I had mixed results because the power conditioners I tested, well, one of them worked and the other two didn't. And also I found that some pieces of gear are more susceptible to noise than others. So the three power conditioners I tested are the Monster Power HTS 5000, the Monster Power HDT 1800, and the Furman M-8LX. Out of these, the only one that I was able to detect any improvement in sound quality was the Monster Power HTS 5000. This power conditioner was discontinued more than 10 years ago, but when it was new, it cost somewhere in the range of $700. With this conditioner, I detected a slight improvement in the noise floor of some audio equipment, but not all the pieces that I tested. With the other two power conditioners I tested, the Monster Power HDT 1800 and the Furman M-8LX, I wasn't able to hear any improvements in sound quality or noise floor in any of the tests that I did. So, with the HTS 5000 that did make a difference, the general trend was that more expensive, higher quality gear had less of a need for power conditioning. This is because better quality gear will have better noise filtering built into its own power supply. With the inexpensive Behringer Truth monitor speaker, there was a fairly easy to notice difference in the noise floor. Here's how it sounded. With the APS Aeon 2 speaker, there was still a difference, but it was very, very tiny and difficult to notice. Here's what it sounded like. I also tested some preamps, and the Behringer ADA-8200 had a noticeable difference, the Art DP2 had a very slight difference, and the Cranbourne Audio Camden EC2 had no detectable difference at all. And by the way, if you like this video, please hit that thumbs up button down there for me, it would be much appreciated, and it would help me make more videos. I also had tested several other preamps by 7th Circle Audio and Cappy, and the general trend was the same. They had very tiny differences with the Monster Power HTS 5000, but not the other ones. I tested a Universal Audio Volt audio interface. I had it plugged into an external power supply, so not using the USB power, 
and I tested it with and without power conditioning. And in that case, I was not able to hear any difference with power conditioning or without it. So in conclusion, does power conditioning make a difference? Well, the two somewhat cheaper power conditioners I tested didn't seem to do anything at all, but the more expensive and heavy duty one definitely did make a small improvement. So if you found this video interesting, you might also like some of my other videos. I did a video where I tested how sample rate conversion can affect sound quality. So if you convert from like 88.2 or 96 kilohertz down to 48 or something like down, down to 44.1 kilohertz, do you lose any sound quality? Well, that gets answered in that video. I also did a video where I tested ADDA conversion if there's noticeable degradation from going through the conversion process. And I'm also working on putting an entire audio engineering course right up here on YouTube. So if that interests you, subscribe to this channel and I'll see you in the next video.